Today, after the service, we've got the Laugh and Connect. And so if you're new to our church and you haven't heard about that in the last few weeks, it's a time where we're connecting with other dinner tables around the community. Um, and so if you're new to us, you missed the boat this time, but there'll be many more that we're going to be doing. Probably already going to start planning one for the next year. Is that all right, Elise? I got the head nod. We're all good. So uh, I'm guessing if you know where you're going, that's cool. You're taking food with you. And if you're hosting, I want to say thank you for opening up your table uh, to people today. And we just pray God's richest blessing over every table that meets today. I just think it's going to be a great day. And love will be given and shown and received. And that's why we do what we do. It's all very good. On Tuesday night, uh, here we have a, a worship uh, rehearsal. It's a new music night. Um, and so for all the worship team, I just want to encourage you to be a part of that and be here. If you think you've got a voice to sing or and you'd like to come along, it's 7.30 on Tuesday night. We're looking at a couple of new tracks. And it's always fun to start something new and see it come to fruition right here in the church as well. But we're going to t- stop and take up our tithes and our offerings. If you come prepared, that's fantastic. If you haven't, just let the bag pass on by. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to give through our tithes and offerings. We thank you, Father, for the generosity that you have placed within this church. And Father, we pray that you continue to sustain and move our church forward, further forward in the kingdom of God. And that through tithes and offerings, Lord, we'll be able to honour you. And Lord, just uh, provide more means for people to come and know you better. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we get into the message, there's a couple of things this morning we're going to do. We're going to honour Stan and Bev, 45 years married today. How cool is that? <laughs> Nearly as long as I've been alive. That's, and isn't that fantastic? 45 years of marriage, I think that's just a real testament to these guys and to see Craig and Lorraine here. So if you don't know, Lorraine's their the eldest. Yes. And, uh, and just wonderful family. Craig's there on the congas. Stan keeps him in line. 45 years of experience needed for that. Is that right, Stan? Yeah. But just, it's just such a wonderful thing as just to be able to celebrate that as a church community too. On the next note, which is kind of sad, Sue and Seamus and the family are flying out for Ireland on Monday week. And we are saddened that you guys are going, but some ways we know that you guys are following a dream and you know it's part of God's plan and so with hearts full of praise we want to just release you guys to be able to to follow that and pray for you guys so I'm wondering whether you and the family could come up and stand with with us come on girls come on down come and stand up here on the platform Now, not all of these guys are going to Ireland on Monday week. It's just three on Monday, is that right? And one on Wednesday. Sean's going on Wednesday. Are you, are you going to Ireland? England. Okay. And who's staying again? These two at the back here are staying. And there's still two other brothers, isn't there? This family is extraordinary, and I can't even keep up with it myself. They, every time I meet with them, they talk about another sibling. That I'm sitting, where does that fit into the process? I don't know, but uh, they're all there. But um, we want to honour you guys and just say thank you to God for the things that you've deposited into our lives. For Trish and I personally, you guys are our friends. And uh, for, yeah, the last four years, excellent. We're going to miss you. Sorry about that. So I was just wondering whether we as a church could stand up and uh, pray for them. And uh, so don't just let it be me praying. So you might just want to raise a hand towards these guys. And uh, well, to the heavens, right? That's who we're praying to, not to so much names. But we're releasing, we're releasing them to follow a dream. So let's just pray together. Father in heaven, I, I want to say thank you for this family. And I know, again, it's not all standing right here on the platform. And I just thank you, Jesus, uh, for the love that this family has for one another. Uh, that's every time you meet these guys, you kind of feel it. And you know it. They welcome you as they welcome family. And maybe that's what saddens me about releasing them because, Jesus, I just know that that heart is so much our heart here. 
that Father, there's this dream that you've placed in these guys and you've placed it there for years. And I just know the hearts of, particularly of Sue and Seamus, as they desire to see the wholeness come back to the human in the place that's both mental and emotional and spiritual and physical. And I just want to pray, Father, for them as they uh, get started on this new journey. You've already given them a road, which means you've already equipped them with everything they need. And so, Father, I pray that you'll remove fear from that road. I pray, Father, that you'll remove any kind of disappointment from that road. And Jesus, I pray that you'll make that road straight. So, Lord, that your word will light the road beneath their feet. They'll hear your voice and be followed and be following your voice, Father. And I know that Sinead and Lorena, they're staying right here and... and I just want to pray for them as they get kind of separated from their family too. And I know that there will be trips back and forward and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to pray, Jesus, a special blessing over them. That the grace and the peace of Christ will rest over your souls as you continue to, to, to grow and to flourish and to thrive. And I pray that you'll continue to hear God's voice as your mum and dad hear God's voice. I pray that you will hear God's voice. And for Sham, when you go to England, I just want to pray over you that the Lord Jesus himself will guide you and lead you, that you will never feel alone, that you will know the power of Christ at all times, and again, that you will hear his voice. And for two sons, I know one of them's in Western Australia or something like that, but I just want to pray, Father, for them, that continually through this family, that your love will flow and it will not be, your love will not be separated or cannot be separated, and I pray that they will continue to be declared over family. Father, I pray for, for Seamus, for new songs, that wherever he finds himself in Ireland, by a sea, by a river, in a green field, uh, that new songs from heaven will be deposited into his soul. And that he will have and already know that he has the means of doing it. I just want to pray, Father, that your voice will be so clear to him and he'll be the voice and the blessing of many. And for many others who come and sit with him, Jesus, I pray that you'll continue to give him eyes to see and ears to hear. For Sue, Jesus, I thank you for, I, I, there's so much I want to thank you for Sue, for she has insight. She has such deep insight into things and she is such a deep thinker and such a, um, just a lover of souls is when I say of you, Sue. And I just know that people are going to find healing through you. People already have. And more will do so. And so Jesus, as a church now, we want to release them in the name of Christ. And to know that whatever church community they find themselves in, Lord, that you will be using them for the glory of the kingdom and the kingdom will be built through them. Father, we thank you for them. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Bless you, guys. The reading this morning is from Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today. I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just pray before we start. 
Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for the reading of your word. Uh, this is a challenging psalm, and I just pray that uh, you would reveal great truths from it and uh, help us to see how this applies to our lives. Uh, Lord, where it's difficult, I pray that you, you would convict us. I pray that you would help us not to shy away from the parts that we, don't, we may not want to hear. Uh, but Lord, help us to find real truth uh, in your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, it's been an interesting week. That's putting it lightly. <laughs> well, today we're going to take a little bit of a break from uh, Hebrews, which we've been looking at for the last, since about what, July, August, something like that. So it's been a while. A um, couple of things I noticed uh, in Hebrews were two things uh, in particular. One, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And maybe two might seem a bit surprising given that it's all about Jesus. The second thing I notice is how frequently it references Old Testament passages. And the writer there is using those Old Testament passages to describe Jesus or to ascribe a particular attribute to him. In the same way today, we're going to look at Psalm 2. And I'm sure as we unpack it together, God will give you a revelation of who Jesus is and the proper response that you are called to. So if you have a Bible, please keep the passage open and we will attempt to understand it together. But first of all, it would be remiss of me not to talk about the story that everyone's been talking about this week. I know if if you were keeping an eye on the media and the news and the internet on Wednesday afternoon, it kind of just exploded. All at once, um, I did hear a story. The Canadian immigration website crashed due to like this mass panic that was sweeping across the U.S. I'm not pushing a political agenda here today, just, just but I, th- I think the media did enough of that during the week anyway. But something I couldn't help but notice as I was preparing the sermon and as I was looking at this passage were just a couple of similarities, as surprising as it might sound, between. Jesus and Donald Trump. (laughs) Go figure. I only came up with two. There's plenty of differences, but here's two similarities. Uh, You know, I'm kind of being a bit unfair on Donald Trump uh, when I'm sort of comparing with Jesus in these two things. Anyway, the first similarity I notice is that both of them have power. Okay? So, and a lot of it. So Jesus, he's the son of God. He's the Christ. It's kind of his birthright. He's, he was there at the creation of the world and he will be there when it is all wrapped up at the end. He had the first say and he'll have the final say. He has power over the entire world. Donald Trump also has power um, or will in a couple of months. It's not quite the whole world, but it is America, um, possibly, you know, probably the, the most powerful country in the world. And his influence will be felt all around the world. So that's one one similarity. The second similarity, though, is probably more interesting. Donald Trump and Jesus are both incredibly divisive. And what I mean by that is that people seem to either deeply love them or they deeply hate them. What you would have seen during the week with Donald Trump is that he got into power. There was a lot of people that liked him. They saw him as the champion of claims against corruption in America, uh, in in the government, a conviction that America had so much changed that it it wasn't recognisable to to what it used to be and that there was this real need to to make America great again, whatever that means, I'm not sure. However, there were a lot of people that didn't like him. Uh, His comments on uh, ethnic minority groups and women and and just many others. (laughs) I don't need to list them all here. Just don't sit well with a lot of people. Uh, And and you can sort of see why. And so much so that a number of protest marches were organised right throughout America, uh, American cities over the last few days, where people were actively saying, this person is not fit to lead this country. Well, let's look at Jesus. There are some people that really love Jesus, some people that give their life for him. 
willing to die rather than deny his name. His followers started off in a small fishing village in Galilee, but have grown in number and spread all over the world, such that 2,000 years after the guy was on the planet, we're still talking about him, we're still meeting here, we're still doing church. But there's also a lot of people that don't like Jesus and cannot stand the fact that his followers insist on following him. They stand in opposition. They prepare to ridicule Jesus. They'll ridicule his followers. They'll say all kinds of things against them. Well, with that in mind, I turn to the first two verses of this psalm. The first thing you might notice if you look at it is how the kings, the rulers of this earth, the people are all taking a stand against God. They're angry with God, they conspire against God, and they plot against God. And the writer of the psalm asks, why? Now, the why here is rhetorical. The writer is genuinely mystified. He's wondering, why on earth would the rulers and the nations take a stand against God? The other thing you'll notice in verse 2 is that the stand is both against God and against his anointed one, his Messiah, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus and the Father are one. If you take a stand against one of them, you take a stand against both of them. The first two verses are quoted in the book of Acts, chapter 4. The context of that story is two of the disciples, Peter and John, have just been released from prison. They were sent to prison on the basis that they wouldn't keep quiet about Jesus. They had seen all he had done and they couldn't stop talking about him. So they were put in prison. But when they were released, in a prayer that when they were gathered with all the other disciples, they interpreted the meaning of these opening verses. When they said, You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit, through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city for Herod, Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, uh, the Gentiles and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. Now, those gathered against Jesus include kings, they include rulers, they include Jews, they include Gentiles. A wide range of people with one thing in common. They're all united against Jesus. But, but why? Why were they so against Jesus? And why is Jesus still a bit taboo to talk about, even in a, a Christian country like Australia? If you read the Bible, read, see Jesus in the Bible, he comes across as a reasonably nice guy, I would think, doing so much for others, um, good moral teaching. When, I, when he was put on trial and sentenced to death, Pilate, the, the ruler, couldn't find a single charge to lay against him. He looked at him and said, this man is blameless. So why is there so much hatred towards Jesus? Well, if we look back at verse 3 of Psalm 2, I think you get part of the answer. The people standing against God and against his anointed King Jesus don't want to live under God's rule. They don't want Jesus to be their king. They don't want to be told how to live their lives and what they can and cannot do. They believe the same lie that the snake told, uh, that the serpent told Adam and Eve in the garden, that God was controlling them and somehow holding out on them by not allowing them to eat from the particular tree. They took the crown from God's head and instead put it on their own head. I'm the boss of my life and no one, especially not God, is going to tell me what to do. Well, some of you might have seen the news where the, with those protests that I talked about. Uh, there, was, there was one where a lot of people were out the, fr out the front of the uh, hotel that Trump was staying in in New York. 
I'm not sure how many people were there, maybe a few thousand or so. But I, I think about Trump and I don't think he was particularly threatened or scared by a couple of thousand people standing there. I mean, he seems in a quite powerful position and he's got New York's finest, I'm sure, protecting him and that sort of thing. So in, in all, in matter of fact, he probably didn't notice. But imagine now if, say, 10 million New Yorkers all went out on the streets, surrounded, you know, the entire neighbourhood around this hotel, then maybe you might take some notice, right? If you couldn't get out of the hotel and, um, you know, you come down and there's mass protests everywhere, you may start to get a little bit worried. Likewise, billions of people might take a stand against God. And do you, what do you think? Would God be worried by that? Yes? Do you think he's, he's saying, oh, oh, what am I going to do? All the people have turned against me. I'm, I'm really, I, I, what am I going to do? I'm going to, oh. Just breathe. No way. No way. God's not worried in the slightest. In fact, this psalm says, the Lord scoffs at them. He laughs at them. It's the only passage in the Bible, actually, where it says God laughs. So good to see God's got a sense of humour about all this. But not really. This is, a, this is a laugh similar to the type when some of you with younger kids or have had, had young kids in the past or know of them, sometimes they, they throw tantrums and they, they say things silly like, you know, eat, eat, eat your vegetables. No, I'm I'm never gonna eat I'm never gonna eat anything again. Hmm. Or they, you know, say, "Oh, clean your room," and like, I'm just gonna run away. <laughs> right? Mum and Dad are laughing, kind of in the way God's laughing here. God's no more concerned about you know your t- two-year-old temper tantrum that you're gonna throw at him. You can't. He's not afraid of you. You can't hurt him. And he can't thwart his plans. Once he's had a good chuckle, I don't don't know how long that lasts, um, God gets angry. He scares everyone who is against him by saying, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. And that is enough to scare anyone who's wanting to stand against him. That king is Jesus, who has been installed on the throne in heaven. You better take that seriously. And then in verse 7, God says to Jesus, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Well, some translations of verse 7 uh, say, You are my son. Today I have become your father. I was talking to a couple of people earlier about different translations in the Bible and normally I don't like to spend too much time dwelling on differences but this particular verse is the one that is quoted uh, three times in the New Testament and ascribing it to Jesus. So I think it's worth just a little bit of time working out exactly what that means and I think you'll be blessed by the understanding of it. So what does the phrase mean? You are my son, today I have begotten you or have become your father. Does it mean that Jesus was like somehow not at one point God's son or or that he can be God's son yet God not be his father? Well, anyway, I spent a long time scratching my head over these sorts of questions during the week. Uh, Got got an answer actually, which was good. (laughs) Thanks thanks to a good Hebrew translation of the word. Uh, But moreover, there's actually a passage in, uh, in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul, perhaps you've heard of him, he's a pretty clever guy when it came to understanding Old Testament passages and how they connected with Jesus. So I'm going to use his answer as well. Firstly, the Hebrew word used in Psalm 2, verse 7, for begotten is yalad. I don't know if there's anyone who's a Hebrew scholar here, but that's my best attempt at pronouncing that. Yalad has the word, has the meaning... <laughs> to bear or to bring forth or to beget. With that meaning in mind, let's look at the New Testament. Uh, As I mentioned, this passage is quoted three times, but in only one of them, 
uh, is an explanation given as to the meaning of it. Uh, the other times it's quoted, it's just quoted, um, just, just because uh, I'm quoting the Old, uh, the Old Testament in, in a section uh, that the writer's doing. So it's actually in Acts chapter 13, and just to give you the context on that particular passage, Paul and his companions are gathered in a place called Pisidian Antioch. Uh, they're in a synagogue on, this, on the Sabbath day, and one of the leaders of the, church, of the synagogue there says, if anyone has a word from God, uh, please speak now. And maybe we could try that one Sunday. We'll see, how that, <laughs> see how that goes. <laughs> well, Paul, he's, he's this sort of keen preacher type. He doesn't need a second invitation. He's got his hand up. He's already up. He's, he's already preaching. He's giving this great explanation of how everything in the Old Testament actually points to Jesus. And he's mid-speech. He's talking about uh, the life of Jesus and how he died on a cross. And then he says from verse 30, But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to our fathers that God has fulfilled his promise in that he raised Jesus up from the dead as it was also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. God has fulfilled his promise, his prophecy that Jesus would come back to life. Remember that the Hebrew word yalad had the meaning to bring forth. In the quote, God is bringing something forth. In the context of that sentence, he is raising Jesus to life. So if you connect the dots there, Jesus was begotten or brought forth from the grave by God. So if you go back to Psalm 2 with this in mind, the passage then becomes read as God raises Jesus to life and installs him as king in heaven. The resurrection of Jesus doubles as his coronation ceremony where he is given the throne. His crown of thorns that he wore on the cross is replaced with a crown of glory. And as the passage describes, God lavishes his blessings upon Jesus. He gives Jesus the nations as his inheritance, the whole earth as his possession. He gives him an iron rod to smash anyone who would stand in opposition, like clay pots. If you try and stand against God, there's a warning here, you won't stand. It says here, he can break you, he can smash you, you can be destroyed. That's what I said about it being a cheery passage. It's difficult to accept that. Some Christians wish to take the view that Jesus being meek and mild. But if you downplay that, if you, if you just say, oh, he's a meek and mild and, and my friend, then you, you downplay his, his power and authority. If Trump becoming president is no trivial matter, then how much greater importance should be placed on Jesus' return to earth as king and as judge? Well, don't worry, that isn't the end of the passage. I finally want to talk about a meeting. Over the past few months, Matt has been sharing with us about a meeting between Abraham and this guy, Melchizedek, whose name means king of righteousness, rules a kingdom of peace, and then the, the meeting of peace, righteousness, ends up with a blessing. A number of us will be meeting around tables in different people's homes later, later for lunch. And everyone brings themselves. Everyone's got something to bring. And I'm sure there will also there be a blessing. But the meeting I want to talk about now is between you, you, whoever you are, and Jesus. And you both bring something here. Firstly, as this psalm concludes, it warns you to act wisely. You can't win if you want to get in a battle with God, a, a fight with Jesus. If you keep ignoring him and don't allow him to be king over your life, then you will be destroyed. So what you should bring to the table when you meet with Jesus is a white flag. 
The appropriate response, if you are in a battle that you cannot win, is to raise a white flag and acknowledge that you surrender. This psalm uses the strange phrase, kissing the sun. What does that mean? In some translations, it comes across as submitting to the sun. In the times of King David, who, who wrote this psalm, armies would be led by their kings into battle, and the king that lost would be expected to, would be brought to the feet of the victorious king. The defeated king would then be expected to kiss, kiss the feet of the victorious king as a sign of submission to him. The appeal here is for you and I to do the same. Be wise. Realise you can't win if you want to fight Jesus. Surrender your life to him. Well, that's what you bring to the table. What does Jesus bring to the table? Jesus brings to the table grace. That's kind of funny because, you know, we normally say grace when we meet around a table. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's interesting that the, uh, the two words are the same. Maybe they're related. This psalm takes me back to art class in school. It was my least favourite subject. Absolutely. See, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I have a lot of great ideas, but um, not a lot of creativity. <laughs> and um, yeah, my, my artworks sounded good in theory, but never turned out right. Never. And, you know, in high school, we also took pottery as part of that. And, oh, that was so frustrating. You know, you, I don't know if anyone's tried pottery, but you can find like you can never get it right. So you're spinning it around and then it kind of looks right. And then, oh, no, it's not quite right. You've got an indentation. It's not smooth, the surface. The top part's kind of, instead of nice and round, it's kind of floppy and, yeah. And then even when you get it right, you think, you put it in the kiln and it comes out and it looks nothing like what you thought it would. You know, it's still got these indentations, there might be a slight crack going through it. Now, when I got the pot back that I made, I kind of accepted as, now oh, that's the best I could do, I'm not very good at this. But imagine you're an expert potter. Are you going to accept a, a pot that has cracks, imperfections? What are you going to do with it? You throw it out. You don't, you don't you know, worry about it, you just, you just turf it out. You, you, you might smash it and then make another one. You certainly wouldn't keep the pot and you certainly wouldn't, you know, honour the pot or, you know, just kind of put it up there as, yeah, this is my, my best one. And you let alone even die for that pot. Why would you die for the pot? But the truth of the gospel is that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. As verse 9 talks about, you, like the clay pot, could easily have been destroyed by the iron rod of Jesus. But the good news is he doesn't do it. He doesn't give you what you deserve, but rather offers you grace. Grace which is so amazing and so undeserved. And when you meet with Jesus and you bring a wholehearted surrender and he brings grace... The net result of that is the blessing of life. The last line of this psalm says, What joy, what joy there is for all who take refuge in him. Death is replaced by life. Destruction replaced by safe refuge in Christ. Brokenness, that broken pot, is replaced by made new and it's a blessing Earlier, I spoke about Adam and Eve uh, believing a lie in the garden. There is also a lie that is believed today by a large proportion of the world. And that is, if, if you choose to live with Jesus as your king, as, as the boss of your life, as the one that is in control, that that takes away. It takes away your freedom. It takes away your joy. It takes away all the good things of life. But the reality of it is it's completely the opposite. Jesus gives life. He doesn't take it. He gives life to the full. If you desire freedom, if you desire joy, if you desire all countless blessings, come to Jesus. Submit to him and allow him into your life 
to take control. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you that even though we choose to ignore your rule, we choose to live with a crown on our own heads, we fail to acknowledge you as king, you still offer forgiveness and you still offer to die in our place. So Lord, please take our lives. Lord, take full control. And I pray, Lord, you breathe new life, abounding in joy. Breathe new life into us. Ensure upon us a blessing of hope. Lord, help us to turn away from our rebellion. Help us to come to you. And in you we will find life and life to the full. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Michael. There's a couple of phrases I really love from what you just said, and I think it's really worthwhile hearing them again. The phrase of taking his crown, Christ's crown, and putting it on our heads. I think that's something of our culture that we just need to hear and listen, because it's about us submitting to Christ, not about him submitting to us. I think there's such power in that phrase to just to know who's in control. And secondly, the phrase of um, bringing things to life or bringing things forth. Do we say the word forth? I don't know. We use that in our language these days, bringing forth something. Is that a biblical word? I don't know. What do we think? But something, if you're a believer, there's something coming forth from you. Yeah? What do you reckon, Honor? There's something coming forth. Yesterday I sat with a, a woman who's 38 weeks pregnant, and something is coming forth. <laughs> And she wanted that to come forth. Uh, she was living in expectation and really hoping it wasn't going to come late. She wanted it to come forth. But she could see it. And, like, and here's how beautiful my youngest son is, Zach. She's 38 weeks pregnant. And he comes up to me and she goes, you reckon she's pregnant? <laughs> and Jake, my oldest son, he goes, why don't you just go and ask her? <laughs> is, that how it, is that how it went? It's just those questions you don't like to ask, but she was expectant, right? And she had this thing that was coming forth. Now, before, like, you may not be pregnant today, and you might be high-fiving everyone because of that, but there is something of life within you that is coming forth that Christ has planted there, that he has placed there, that you will be known by. And he's wondering today whether you want to come into that place of life or you want to stay in that place of rebellion and tell God everything he's doing wrong. Because that's what Israel was doing. That's what we do at times too. Father, why aren't you working at my pace? I've got a time frame here, Father. I'd really love for you to do it that frame. And if you're not going to do it in my frame, I'm going to stand against that. And I'm going to get bitter and I'm going to get resentful, right? Does that, is anyone like... Like, I know what that feels like, and I know what that looks like, but that's us standing in rebellion and not submitting, and us saying to Jesus, how about we wear the crown for a while? And Jesus goes, well, let's just see how that works out for you. Anyone been there? Yeah. I've been there, right? I know what that feels like. And at times you come to that place of the white flag, as Michael would say, and you submit, you surrender. And a surrender is not a word that we like to use a lot in our culture, but to surrender to somebody that is all-powerful and all-loving and has this place of grace that he just invites us into to bring forth life from you. And it sounds too good to be true, but when you are in that place of intimacy with Christ, all of a sudden you realize how futile it is to live your life in a place of rebellion. And you realize that what you carry is Christ himself and he is the potter. He is the one who takes that clay shape and makes it into perfection. And all of your cracks all of a sudden start become places where glory actually fills and people can see that you are a person who has been made whole, right? It sounds kind of odd, but that's just the story of my life. 
And I know it's the story of many lives right here in this room. And so I wonder whether this morning as we sing this last song of amazing grace that we can put our cracked uh, lives or broken lives just before God and just say, bring your glory to be through that and make all things new again and just allow the glory of God to be seen today. Could we, could we do that? And just to say, God, your timing is perfect. I'm just going to go with that. Can we just go with that too? And even though it just sounds like it's just everything works against your happiness or your your place where you want to be feeling free. But in that is a statement of faith to say, God, I know that you have my best interests at heart and I'm just living for the glory of your name. Could we do that today? And just come into that place of faith. So thank you, Michael, for opening up Psalm 2 in that way. And just to say today is a day where God can be revealed, where Christ can be revealed as the Son of God, as the King of Kings. May the peace of Christ go with you all. Thank you for coming to church today. Look forward to seeing you next week.